So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Sorry we're getting started a little late. So we'll get going. Um, we have four amazing panellists to share with you uh, today. We're going to be talking about base signing and how they've been estimating ecosystem services and identifying their sites. Um, so I'm joined by, uh, I think initially we're going to have, uh, so I'm going to try and do this in order, I'm joined by Chelsea Fuge of Bristol Avon Catchment Market. Um, then Chris Perkins is going to be sharing from the Carbon Bank. Then we'll have Bryony Fox from Y and Esk Valley, and then Ben Hart's joined us from Natagal as we talk about Highlands rewilding and other projects they're working on. So, and then we'll have time for a Q and A session at the end. So please do submit your questions. You can put them in the chat or you can put them in the Q and A. Um, and I'm going to stop so we can sort of hear from the experts at work. So the the format's going to be each each panelist will just present on their project. So we want to understand sort of the background of their project, and then we're going to ask a few questions of each panelist around um, sort of details around sort of challenges and lessons learned in baselining. So Chelsea, are you able to? Um, thanks so much for joining us for start, and we'd love to hear from you first. Lovely. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I have popped together a few slides just to introduce uh, the basics of the Bristol Avon Catchment Market. So if it's okay, I'll start with that. Yep, great. Let me make sure I have the screen. Okay. Can I check that you can all see that in a and it's presented in a normal fashion <laughs> on your screens? Yep, we can see the slide and then the next slide panel. Yeah, that's a strange one, isn't it? Um, there we go is that better yeah perfect yeah, thank you <laughs> there we go I was a bit confused with that one um great so yeah I'll try and give a, a brief overview of uh what the Bristol Avon Capture Market is and, and the work that we've been um undertaking so um we'll go through these quickly um so the Bristol Avon Capture Market is essentially um piloting uh, a marketplace, an online marketplace, to sell local high impact and verified nature-based projects um, uh, by delivering the environmental services from those projects to uh, buyers. Um, and the market should make it easier for farmers and land managers to actually earn money from environmental nature-based projects on their land um, and offer um, a highly ethical way of, of screening and selling to buyers uh, for a need, regulatory and, and voluntary. So I think this is probably um, quite base level considering the, the types of people that we've got on the call, but essentially um, through the market, farmers and land um, holders are able to uh, deliver uh, and maintain nature-based projects in the Bristol Avon catchment market area that delivers a range of environmental services. Um, so the nature-based projects, I think we're all familiar with what that is, and the environmental services that we looked into scoped across nutrient mitigation, biodiversity gain, water quality improvements, flood mitigation, carbon sequestration, and, and any other outcomes that we could accredit for um, from those nature-based projects. So the overall kind of outline of um, the catchment market is essentially, we've got buyers on one side, which um, may come from kind of like a public goods, community or government demand, or private benefits from business, financial institutions, or private investors, and they come forward with their, their demand. So, it may be that there's a developer with um, a set requirement of biodiversity units for, for offset, um, or it might maybe, like I said, a, a business trying to, to buy for private benefits, um, maybe for carbon towards reducing their carbon footprint, et cetera. So they come into the market with, with basically their requests, their demand. Um, and from the other side, we supply um, a pipeline of, of basically landscape scale projects. So sellers, um, our landholders and our farmers, we work with them to pull together various nature-based projects. Um, and these go in into the middle. Um, and basically the middle is overseen by a catchment market operator. Um, and in this case, the catchment market operator is Entrade, um, who is a, uh, a subsidiary arm of Wessex Water. Um, and they accredit the projects for the environmental services. Um, and that's obviously then matched through uh, a settlement algorithm. 
which has been developed by the University of Exeter. Um, we've had a, a number of professors working on a, a unique um, settlement algorithm. Um, and that will obviously, well, hopefully match the demand uh, and projects will get matched through the, through the settlement process. So that's a, that's a really basic overview. And, and my, my role particularly has been in developing the seller pipe, pipeline um, of this side of the market. So working directly with landholders, obviously with it within my team baseline and then evaluating which um, environmental services we can generate from these projects. So we're kind of at the point at the moment where we've um, been through a long period of project development. Uh, in fact, <laughs> the whole Bristol Avon catchment market it, um, in, its, in its basic form has been undergoing development right from the start. It's a very obviously complex um, thing to work our way through, especially with all the external change and factors with legislation and different LPAs approach and all sorts of different factors really. So it's been ongoing development. But we have got to the point now where we have um, an actual registered pipeline of landholders or sellers who are willing to, to, to put forward their projects, their nature-based projects uh, for us to accredit. So we've, we've met that stage two and we are literally on the verge of actually running the market settlement process. So we're about to open for buyer registration on the buyer side. Uh, and that will obviously go into settlement of whichever projects can be settled or services can be matched to the demand. And then contracting and delivery, we'll have a contracting and delivery phase of around 12 months following that. So, I mean, the whole idea of this is that we're offering um, positive benefits for both the, the buyers and the sellers. So from the seller side, landholders, we really feel that they should be paid fairly for putting environmental nature-based projects on their land. We see it as a way that they can diversify their farm revenue. They can benefit from the growing market for environmental services and they can contribute to nature's recovery. Um, and from the buyer side, um, they're obviously looking for value for money, environmental credits, but they can very importantly that they can trust. So um, we're looking at businesses, obviously, that are interested because they want to demonstrate leadership. They want to comply with regulatory or planning requirements. They want to meet consumer or employee expectations and they want to maybe build resilience in a changing um, policy environment. So we kind of offer all of those benefits we hope um, and sat behind all of this is what we feel is quite a powerful collaboration so as i've said we've got n trade as the catchment market design and operator um, but we've also then got two wildlife trusts so avon and wiltshire wildlife trust uh, which is i work for wiltshire wildlife trust but i manage the the delivery team over both wildlife trusts um, um, and, and we're obviously really interested in making sure that these projects are, are really high integrity, that we've got really, really strong ethical frameworks in place on both sides of the market, um, that the nature based solutions we're putting forward are, are, are ecologically valuable, that they basically right tree, right place. And all of this has been backed uh, initially by the Green Recovery Challenge Fund um, and the National Lottery uh, Heritage Fund. So throughout the whole process, we've been really, really um, fortunate to be able to work extremely closely with DEFRA and Natural England particularly, um, so helping us with our accreditation documents before the net gain mandate is actually um, in place this November, so we've, we've managed to design a set of documents which they've approved for this market round. And our overall objectives are basically to deliver on ground uh, habitat creation, restoration and improvement projects in line with nature, uh, local nature recovery strategies where they exist. Um, demonstrate how these projects can deliver on climate change and nature's recovery, so bringing that private finance model in, um, and developing that environmental services sector to create that new source of wealth and employment as well. So we've also taken on trainees and kickstarts through this process. And um, most importantly, this is a pilot market round, so it's a lot of uh, capturing feedback for improvement for future market rounds and obviously aiding with that transition as we move towards net gain particularly. Uh, very briefly, those are a, a suite of our project types that we looked at in this first market round, all of them on a 30 year term to meet the minimum requirement for biodiversity gain. And just as a brief recap, um, being mindful of time because I do love to chat, <laughs> um, is just that, uh, yeah, we're, we're very much at the stage now where we are right on the cusp of preparing for market round one. The landholder engagement side of things is complete and we've got project development complete and sellers have now registered those projects. They're basically accredited. Um, buyer registration is the kind of final stage 
uh, before we then head into the pre-market review where we'll publish information publicly on what the um, demand on both sides of the market looks like. Uh, and then the market round is due to run in March. So it's all a very exciting time on the project and a lot of work coming to fruition now. Uh, and there's just our web page and our contact email if you do want to get in touch with some more information. But um, I think I'll end there. But thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, so, yeah, I just want to just remind us that we've got four panellists and we've got to whip through these questions on base signing. So, um, Chelsea, I've got like one minute to ask you three questions on base signing, but hopefully oh. we'll have time at the end yeah. to come back. So, <laughs> yes. um, I know we've only got 10 minutes with each uh, with each presenter. So um, I wanted to talk to you about identifying the sites and then the metrics that you used and some of the yeah. challenges. So I don't know if you can just give us a flavour of that and then hopefully we'll have a bit more time at the end to yeah. come back and ask you specific questions on baselining. Yeah, so we um, we we stuck to um, accreditable metrics, metrics that are widely accepted at the moment. So um, biodiversity metric, DEFRA's biodiversity metric 3.1 is what we've primarily uh, used. We've also looked into Woodland Carbon Code and Nutrient Accreditation Standard that's been approved by uh, through Wessex Waters uh, Development Work. Um, but we had lots of complications with stacking um, and also our timelines within a market. So we have primarily ended up focusing on biodiversity gain for this market round, although our intention and for private finance to truly work for ecological recovery, etc. We need that stacking. So that's our aim for future market rounds. Um, and we did have challenges with our with the, using the biodiversity uh, metric as well. So um, I think there's some definite key points there to flag in terms of what we want to see as ecologically valuable habitat creation um, and also what uh, the limitations and constraints that are put in currently by the um, by the metric. So and I'm sure that comes with lots of other accreditation methods at the moment as well. Um, so we have seen a very um, a very specific set of projects that have been able to come forward, whereas actually the scope from landholders and what they were willing to put forward was much wider in context. Mm. So I think we've got a lot of development there to move forward with to make sure that we can actually facilitate and accredit those types of projects where ecologically we feel they're valuable. Brilliant. Thank you. And and just just as we see, because I know we talked about it, was the um talked about it before, was the sort of ec ecological expertise that you needed? Um, yeah. When, would you be able to share about that? Yeah, yeah. So we we have been a very small team um, of primarily ecologists um, that have obviously had to kind of cover a large area of the Bristol-Laden catchment, um, so spanning over multiple LPAs. So we've had to be um, quite skilled and quite efficient, and, and we have found a couple of things as we've gone along, actually, that are really useful to kind of know now. So, I mean, the key things are being competent in using UK hubs, using some sort of kind of um, mapping software like ArcGIS Pro or something similar. Um, but also it's kind of key that you have that really good knowledge of irreplaceable habitats, of, um, of nature connectivity, if there's any LNRS maps available and, and things like that. UK wildlife and key legislation is really, really critical. Um, the biodiversity net gain good practice principles is key if you're working with the, the DEFRA metrics, you actually understand what you're input into the tool and how you evaluate that. Um, but on top of that, we also one thing that we found uh, when we were assessing sites, if you if you're assessing uh, land within the riparian zone of rivers, um, etc, that need for more surveys, so modular river physical survey, and that's a very specific and expensive um, training tool that was we found that was needed pretty quickly on. So. Um, Basically, yeah, don't don't underestimate, don't forget those kind of extra parts when you're working across landscapes and actually you suddenly have kind of a water habitat put into your terrestrial um, habitat as well. But yeah, that was our kind of key findings. Ecolo ecology background was very much needed. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Chelsea. It's great. And um, so I'm going to invite people. The chat function does work. And please use the Q&A in case you've got questions for Chelsea. It might be um, good to just post them up there and then Chelsea can see them and maybe type in the answers mm -hmm. as well if you wanted to do that. Um, and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, Chris, if we could come to you now and you could share about Carbon Bank. So Carbon Bank has developed, or oh, Chris has developed an incredible tool um, that he's going to walk us through and share a bit about the project as well. So over to you, Chris.
unmute. Can you hear me now? Good. Yes, all clear. Okay. I'll tell you a wee bit about um, Carbon Bank, and then I'll move into the tool that we've developed through NERF funding. Um, so Carbon Bank, we're part of the Ecotricity Group of Companies. Um, and Ecotricity has a long history of innovative projects and starting innovative companies. Uh, so it's the first green energy company. It owns Britwind, which makes small turbines. Devil's Kitchen, which is vegan food, um, Forest Green Rovers, a very sustainable football team, Buy Diamonds, making diamonds from captured carbon dioxide. Uh, the electric highway was put up to encourage people to um, buy electric cars and get around the chicken and egg thing of, you know, you buy a car and there's no charging. And Nemesis was the first, or was, Ecotricity decided to build a sports car 10 years ago to demonstrate that you can have fun and electric cars. So that's the kind of background that we're coming from with um, Carbon Bank. And Ecotricity has a very strong ethos. It always operates sustainably uh, wherever possible. It demonstrates innovation um, with the idea of making innovation mainstream. And Carbon Bank's been set up to really, one part of it, which we'll cover with the tool today, is land sequestration, uh, carbon sequestration through land management, but also any novel technologies that lead to sequestration, anything that contributes to UK net zero ambitions, verifiable solutions um, for habitat, for reversing habitat depletion, or reducing emissions. We like to provide straightforward, simple solutions that are verifiable when it comes to carbon sequestration. Um, but we also have a strong bias towards biodiversity, rewilding, nature recovery, nature conservation. So quite a wide remit. And really what I'm going to show you today is a tool that's designed to solve a problem for part of that company. Um, the part that does the, the land management and mainly tree planting. So um, we had enough funding and the whole idea of the tool is to streamline decision making and allow modeling so that we can look at existing and potential future ecosystems, uh, financial forecasting, and it's a decision support tool but for different audiences, so it can inform uh, decision making for the site manager, what would be ecosystem services, sequestration data for carbon bank planning, as well as milestone reporting for authority to proceed to directors who are not necessarily plugged into the uh, nuances of NVC and tree planting and um, all of the other biodiversity. Um, we, come up with. So the idea is it provides a fast and objective assessment system so that we can make decisions about site, any site within the UK that comes up for sale that we might want to purchase or we might want to manage with a third party uh, while it's in that window when it's in the market. And that's really quite an important um, criteria for the tool. And it also provides a standardised output so we can A, B different sites. We can look at different sites and say this site is better for sequestration or, or whatever. Um, because it's got a standardised output, that can be put into a second spreadsheet, which I won't show you today. Okay. So, I believe you have the, yeah. If I can have the next slide. So we've called it the Carbon Bank Assessment Tool. Uh, just and the important thing to remember is it's a decision support tool, not a decision making tool. So what it allows us to do is look at lumps of land and it helps us make a decision. It provides metrics on the site that um, help us make a decision. Thanks, please. Um, 
and as I've said earlier, it, it provides different levels of information for different levels of decision makers. And it's really important that you can do that so that you don't have to, you know, a director doesn't have to wait through a 14 page report on the site. Um, okay, go to the next slide, please. So the process we use is we'll identify a site either through the internet or land managers or um, land agents or through our network or whatever, run it through the tool based entirely on the um, Forestry Commission ESC tool, which I'm not sure if you'll be familiar with, Ecological Site Classification Tool. And what that does, we'll go through this in a minute, is identify uh, suitable trees for that site. Let's just move to that. And then on phase two, we can go back and we can look at the site on the ground if we decide it's worth looking at and put in real life data rather than generic data from from ESC. Can have the next slide, please. Um, and as I said earlier, the standardization allows us to look at one site and another site and compare one with the other. And the tools designed to allow that to happen. And the problem it's solving is this. Um, every piece of land fits somewhere in this team. That you, know, you a management prescription will give you biodiversity and ecosystem services, gains or losses. Um, when it comes to sequestration, the land class will and underlying geology and everything else will give you some idea of how much carbon can be sequestered and one cost per hectare if you're running a business you know, these you may be able to come up with some very nice uh, management solutions but if the land cost is 15 20 25 thousand pounds a hectare you may not be able to run it into a business so that is the sort of rubik's cube that the tool is designed to help solve if we could go on please i'm not going to go through these but this is the, the process you have to go through and we'll go i'll step through woodland carbon code and um the uh esc tool in a minute you have to go through all that lots of sheets of paper lots of analysis and what this does is it synthesizes a bit draws all of the information together so you put information in it produces a report at the bottom we'll go on um so are you, I don't know if you're familiar with um, ESC, Environmental Site Classification Tool. Basically, you drop a pin on your site, you decide which species that you want to look at. Um, and here, what the tool does is it looks at, what the ESC tool does, looks at um, three different scenarios in, I think I'm right here, now 2050 and 2080 um, and the tool looks at those because some trees you might plant now will not be suitable in 2080 so the tool filters all of those uh, go on. and the output it just gives you a list of suitable trees and suitability down here if we go on that's just a close-up so the two things I'm looking for is ecological suitability. We need that to be over 75 or trees to be suitable on the site. And yield class, which is related to sequestration. So that's just a blow up of one of the outputs of ESC. We copy that and put it into the tool, if we could go on. Um, and the other thing that ESC will do is it will predict the National vegetation classification type for that site. So this is why we have two phases. One, I'm using a tool that is based on um, all of S background information. If we like the site, you go and look at it and you go and choose this. But this is suggesting that site, that blob that I put on the map earlier, should be a W6 older with uh, stinging nettle woodland. It doesn't go into subclasses, but um, yeah, we'll just blow it up there. So if we go on, 
what the tool does, and I'll briefly show you the tool in a minute if it's just a, um, a plot from it. So having put input the ESC data into it, it will give us an MVC community type. And here I've said you know, the highest number there, 71, the closest, ah, this is a completely different site, sorry, closest this site that I've run this one on is going to be a W17 oak with blueberry, this upland oak. Um, this doesn't do anything apart from sit there looking pretty. Um, and you run through that and it will give you suggested tree species. And again, because this is just the first broad brush, we just accept these species are what which go into the point, which will then inform from another part of the input data from ESC, you know, which trees are preferable on that point. It will make a little more sense when we go back to the tool later on. So to clue on, please. The engine for calculating, the reason I showed that mess of um, processes earlier is because you have to put data into this, which is the wooden carbon code calculator. If we can move on, there are 13,000 of these, and it will sift through for each tree that you put in. It will sift through. Um, you have to put in a, a planting prescription, a spacing, um, and your yield class from ESC, and so on. Part of the beauty of this tool is it stays having to do all of that work. It does it within the tool. If we can move on. Um, Yep, so I'm hopefully now I'm going to be able to share the tool with you. Um, Chris, I'm just going to, for um, time's sake, um, maybe we'll just ask you a couple of questions while you're sharing the tool. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, and I know you're going to, it's a, it's a piece of beauty, Chris's <laughs> uh, spreadsheet. So please do show it because I think it's just so helpful to see. But um, I just wondered if you can sort of also just sort of talk about what some of the challenges were in building the model that obviously assesses the site um, on the types of trees that should go on it and then sort of models against what kind of carbon payments will come out that can then allow you to value what the site is and whether you're going to whether you're going to pay for it. Yeah, um, integrating the two, I mean, honestly, you don't want to know how it integrates, but integrating the two was very difficult. Um, and that was just a matter of, of programming and predicting um, and making sure that data you put in actually made sense when it came out the other end. Um, integrating two massive big data sets was quite difficult. And is it, um, is it possible that you could use the tool from be for beyond just with the Woodland Carbon Code? I don't know if it would work with other ecosystem services. I, I think it will. And we've, we've looked at peatland. Um, you really do need something that's predictable. I don't think it would work that well with BNG just because there are far too many variables and far too many cross references um, i don't think that would work at all this what this does is it looks for one-to-one -one ratios or one-to-one -one connections um, so it might work with people and we've done some work looking at that uh, yeah so this is the tool um uh, is it, if, you, if you had one thing to just to point to before we go to Bryony, just for timing, and hopefully people will have lots of questions for you. I'm seeing questions coming on the chat and then the Q and A. Um, what would what would you want to point out? Um, really, the fact that it is usable by somebody who hasn't necessarily got expertise um, in the first sift. Second sift, you really need to go on site and know what you're looking for. Um, I think just the simplification, the fact that that mess, that bird's list I showed you earlier, of all the processes you have to go through without a tool, in half an hour, I can make an assessment of a tool 
uh, um, of, of a, a site and get a decision off a director whether we should proceed or not. Mm. That's amazing. <laughs> so, thank you. I'm sorry we don't have um, more time to go through the tool, but um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you and, and we'll probably be asked to give a longer session <laughs> to walk through it at some point. And um, thanks, Chris. And um, so, Bryony, um, we'd love to hear from you sort of very briefly outlining the project. And then I know we've got some questions around the importance of ground truthing in your specific project. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I will just do the technological uh, sharing of the screen. Tell me when you can see the slides. Yep, we can see them. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'll just give a quick summary of what my project's about. So I, um, my name is Brownie Fox. I work for the Northgate Moors National Park Authority, and we did a joint project with Palladium um, specifically to look at designing and testing a model for restoring nature with blended finance in the Esk Valley, uh, which is a, a, a river catchment in uh, the northeast of England, um, stretches uh, pr pretty much from the east of Gisborough into. Um, into Whitby, most people know where Whitby is, and we were particularly looking at how we can deliver uh, benefits um, to nature and the environment while providing alternative means of income to land managers and working with a consortia of land managers as well, because most of our um, land managers in that area are either small holdings, less than 100 hectares, a lot of tenant farmers, uh, a couple of big estates, but you know, how could they all work together to realise those benefits? So that's the Esk Valley there, quite a big catchment. It covers about a third of the National Park. Um, and the object objectives of the project was um, to look at a very, you know, nature restoration land use options with a group of land managers working with an existing farmers group, which was really important because it helped us to get the project up and running really quickly. Um, we only had a year to develop our project and we wouldn't have been able to do that without already having the, uh, you know, the trust uh, and the, the knowledge of that working group. Um, so that's one of the big key learnings that has come out of this. Also identifying a range of ecosystem services. So what, what could be stacked, uh, what, what would work in that particular suite of habitats, uh, what ecosystem services could we deliver there. Um, designing and testing a commercial model. So looking at what the actual um, costs of restoration would be, where revenue might come from to deliver that restoration and what were the opportunities then for income uh, for land, land managers. Um, and then creating that sort of uh, scalable concept to enable us to use that model elsewhere in the park. So in order to determine the baseline, we wanted to understand what we already had in the catchment. Um, so we did a natural capital assessment. We worked with a natural capital research. Um, we did a baseline report for each estate, which looked at natural capital stocks and ecosystem services reports and or ecosystem service flows. And, and that was really important because we wanted to understand, first of all, what theoretically was available in the catchment, but then also um, ground truth in that with uh, other data from particularly from land owners and land managers themselves. And we used publicly available data uh, to create that baseline report, but that was just a starting point. That wasn't particularly what we then based all of our, um, all of our further work on. We did further work with each of the landowners and land managers. Then we looked at opportunities in the market. Um, so what were what was available? What would what could and should we um, look at marketing? And we decided on uh, carbon from woodland creation and water quality outputs from uh, from grassland management. There's lots of other opportunities, but they were the two that were potentially the biggest opportunity in terms of what um, investment investors were probably available to, do, to, to support at that time. How would we then um, 
design all of that restoration so we work with land managers to understand you know where that could happen and what sort of interventions would be required um, we did then some natural capital modeling of restoration scenarios that helped us to then understand what the potential income opportunities would be and then we then did the bespoke cash flow model for each restoration scenario and each each of the land managers that participated then got a um, a report like this which showed there's a whole complicated model behind that and we haven't got time to, to show that but we we've got some other um, outputs from the work um, an ebook and, and a final report we can share for more information but we wanted to make sure that each land manager went away with an idea of what their natural capital was worth so for this particular land holding it identified the area of woodland that could be created how much it would cost to establish and the management costs of that uh, and what the potential uh, income uh, I'm sorry additional costs around verification for carbon code and monitoring but then what the potential income could be so that land managers could then make an informed choice about whether or not that was an income stream they wanted to pursue um, and similarly looking at grasslands um, we wanted to understand you know what the similar opportunity was for grassland restoration and there was um you know so we we looked at um various different ways of funding um these sort of economic returns uh, we looked at biodiversity net gain we looked at uh, 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 potential uh, carbon codes we looked at investor uh, for sort of biodiversity credits uh, and we looked at um, uh, what was the other one uh, it'll come to me in a minute so we looked at various different options and some of them were easily realizable now uh, so there's already an established woodland carbon code for example so it was easy to get into that but then there were other opportunities like biodiversity net gain for example that actually would be very difficult to realize in a national park setting because we're a protected landscape and we don't really have the significant amount of um, development in the park that would realize the sorts of um, gains through biodiversity net gain because you wouldn't be able to have any sort of very limited compensatory um habitat creation in the national park setting so you know we were, we wanted to be realistic as well so where we couldn't find a private buyer you know we did signpost people towards public funded as well um, so in this case we looked at stewardship and then finally we want i mean there's a very quick summary we wanted to reassure our land managers that we weren't trying to convert them from farmers you know they it's very important for their identity that they are farmers they're food producers you know a lot of these tenants particularly have been you know their third generation tenants on on these landscapes and they didn't want to be seen as you know nature conservers they saw that as part of their identity but actually first and foremost they were farmers so we wanted to do some visualizations to reassure land managers that the sorts of interventions we were looking at like increase so this is a before and after uh, you know summary of, of what a particular dale might look like um so you know you've got you've got a bit more woodland here you've got uh, more hedge lines you've got uh, more um uh, just general sort of diversity of land management you haven't you know more trees up in the bank side here so with actually relatively small amounts of intervention that would realize financial opportunity from investment or public funding you could still have a productive working landscape and that was really important for our land managers and landowners to 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 um to know that we'd appreciated that that was a concern of theirs um so i'll come out of the slideshow and be um, there to ask questions sorry that wasn't as in-depth as the others but i'm just conscious we haven't got a great deal of time no i really appreciate that Bryony. thank you and um, you're still sharing your screen i believe because i can see all that I, 
heads sorry yeah there we go and um, no no don't worry at all and um, i know and I, we really could have like an hour on each of these projects can we at least because they're just so interesting and there's so much work that's gone in i appreciate that we're asking people to hone in on just one part of the milestone so just really briefly before we come to ben and um, i know that you and i had talked about that importance of while you had um um had base signing done using satellite imagery that actually there was really important role on ground truth things. So I wonder if you could just sort of share about how you did that before we move yeah, to Yeah, so, um, so as part of our project, we worked with the Farm Facilitation Fund uh, coordinator, who is also a local farmer, well-known and trusted. And we also had a project officer. So when we'd done the um, baseline survey, so we did one of the whole valley and we did one for each farm holding within the valley as well. Um, so on the one that we did um, with uh, Natural Capital Research, it showed all of the potential opportunity for nature recovery, for woodland creation and, uh, sorry, for ecosystem services, for woodland creation and uh, grassland um, management. Um, and what we did first of all, before we showed each landowner that, we went to them and said, you know, where, if you were going to do land in, um, you know, grassland enhancement or woodland creation on your property, where would you do it? And we had a base a base map and they marked all that up. We then showed them what the computer said, you know, this is the, this is the ideal, this is the ultimate, this is the opportunity. Um, and then we kind of rationalized the two images and we said, okay, so, you know, why was it, why is it particularly that you weren't interested in doing woodland creation there when the computer says that that's a really good place to do it? And, you know, from sort of cultural and historical and sentimental reasons, you know, they said, well, we don't want to plant trees there because that's a really important, you know, migratory bird place. Or, you know, every summer we have a big family picnic in that meadow and, it, you know, we wouldn't want to lose that because that's something that's important to our to our heritage and our, and our family. So, you know, taking on board those really sort of special places for those individuals was really important. And we were then able to then come up with a a scenario for woodland creation and grassland management uh, enhancement that took into account all those um, mm. areas that you know were probably less than ideal from the land manager's perspective and that still gave a really good opportunity for woodland creation and I think the other uh, and, land, and grassland management and the other good thing that came out of that was you could you know each land manager could start to see then how it connected in with their neighbour uh, which was really important as well because we were trying to build this consortium model and while we haven't been able to take it forward in terms of delivering against it yet we have found that land managers are starting to work together to apply for other funding streams that we have available in the national park through farming and protected landscapes for example so that's been a really positive outcome of that um, yeah Um, thanks, Brian. I think that's just really helpful to hear, you know, as much as we're trying to create a one size fits all so we can get things done quick in the end, it's people's land and, and they have different feelings about what should go on them. Um, so I know this question, there's a question just gone up for you, Bryony, in the Q&A, if you don't mind coming to that as we move to Ben. And then Chris, just to flag, there's a question from Annie Gordon in the chat for you about the um, tool and whether it factors in the additionality tests for wood and carbon codes. I don't know if you're able to just type into the chat and answer uh, answer Annie's yeah. question uh, and thanks um, Bryony for answering Kate's question so Ben um uh coming to you now I know you've got you do some weird and one well not weird wonderful things of base happening and slightly unusual um away from the standard you know woodland carbon code and the use of uh, the sort of regular tools on some of the land that you're working on the project so really looking forward to sort of hearing brief overview of the project and we can get into some of those sort of baseline to tools you've been using Great, thank you. Um, can I check you can hear and see my slides if I do that? Yes, we can. They're not in slideshow mode, but that's fine. But just we can see them. How about now? There you go. Yeah, they are now. Perfect. OK, so I, yeah, I'll try and keep this punchy because it's always nice to get to the questions. Um, my name's Ben Hart. I'm actually, I work across two companies. I'm the head of operations at Natagal, uh, four days a week, uh, which is a relatively new company. We're about a year old. And we've been set up by the founders of NEP Wildland, which many of you will be aware of, um, as a nature restoration at scale company. So um, Natagal actually has two natural capital assets, essentially develop 
to buy land, uh, ecologically degraded land, and then develop them as natural capital projects or nature recovery projects. And our first site uh, was uh, Boothby uh, Farm, which is in uh, Lincolnshire, just near Grantham. We have recent, recently actually just bought a second site uh, called High Fen, which is um, in Norfolk, which is just on the edge of the Fen, which is really exciting. I also do a day a week at Highlands Rewilding, which is another sister company to Natagal. So I say we're a, we're, a, we're a trio of sister companies joined at the board. After the founder of Highlands Rewilding, Jeremy Leggett, is also on the board of Natagal. And Highlands Rewilding has two sites in Scotland. So we have the original Bunloyd estate, which is literally on the shores of Loch Ness here, which is very exciting. And then we have um, Bell Dorney, which is a, used to be a, um, a sheep farm. It's been a sheep farm for about 40 years. About 80% of the land is grazed sheep fields. Uh, so what we've got across these two, um, entity, two entities and four estates is a whole selection of different habitat types, which is really exciting. So we've been going slightly different from others in that we have been obviously sort of putting our money where our mouth is as well or our investors money and actually buying land and looking at different habitats so if you have arable reversion projects at Boothby um, the high fen has uh, is a kind of opportunity for really exciting wetland lowland peat, peatland restoration project uh, Bun Noise itself has multiple different but ancient woodlands down here it's got conifer plantations which have been taken out and at the top of the hill you can't see it but there's a whole piece of peatland that we're doing peatland restoration work which is really exciting uh, and then Beldorni is kind of pasture really overgrazed for, for many many years uh, I'd also be remiss to say, if I didn't mention Highlands Rewilding is currently undertaking what we think is one the world's first retail crowdfund for a commercial rewilding entity um, it's currently got almost 500 investors investing everything from 50 quid up to 100,000 um, pounds and we recently hit about 700 Okay, which is really exciting. So if you're interested in, in getting involved and finding out what, what it's like being an investor in one of these projects, um, please do look at that. Um, just a quick example, I'm just going to go through, I'm going to rattle through these, but essentially um, at all the sites, we've taken a slightly different tack in that we've sort of engaged with all of the high tech and all of the kind of market, and we've tried our best to map out our baselines using the best available data. Not necessarily... Um, needing to or wanting to focus on any particular um, natural capital income stream because we know they're all in flux. We are talking to all of them, we're working with many of them. Uh, but as a just as an example with, with with Boothby here, I won't go through all these in detail, but essentially Boothby is um, it's a farm and we've spent the first year mapping out the kind of metrics that we, we would need for looking at biodiversity and carbon credits. Uh, we're also actually one of the Boothby is one of the 22 landscape recovery pilots as part of the new ELMS program, which is very exciting. Uh, first year is all baseline activities, and then that's led into opportunities for intervention. So for example, at Boothby, we're gonna be looking at uh, river restoration. We've, uh, this week, we've started putting in some new ponds, um, and there's lots of work around water actually, which is really, really cool. Um, uh, so just as a quick couple of slides, um, carbon or a carbon baseline actually is, is becoming relatively simple, as you might expect, compared to biodiversity. Uh, but we very much focused on on the carbon in soil carbon um, and here you can see some trucks with some cores on on the back of them and they were going over the farms going down to a meter uh, length in terms of soil carbon and then we've been working with the various companies looking at how we can use drone data lidar data and on the ground ground truthing to map out kind of woody vegetation and here's an example of a of a piece of land at boothby that's been digitally created to model some of the, the woody biomass we've got on the site at the moment. Uh, biodiversity uh, baseline, we've actually focused, because biodiversity is the entire web of life and it's really complicated, um, we've actually focused on uh, seven specific metrics for, for Boothby and we've kind of aligned it with the Plan Vivo Operation Wallacea credit methodology that's been developed and we've been working closely with them. But we're also looking at a few other credit calculation opportunities, including a company called Pivotal Earth. Um, and we are also engaging with Vera and Gold Standard because we know that they are looking at various different biodiversity credit standards. And we really wanted to try and go all in on the data so that we have the opportunity to then feed in that data into credits as they get developed. So just quickly running through these, we picked seven, one of them being the DEFRA biodiversity metrics. So we've had a UK HABS assessment done at Boothby. So we can, if we want to, go down the biodiversity net grain route, but there are 
various reasons why we might or might not do that. Um, and where possible, we've also aligned our surveys with standardised methodologies. So, for example, we've been doing breeding bird surveys and, and butterflies, uh, according to the UK BMS. Uh, we've also looked at higher plant diversity, so we've had vegetation surveys done across the site. Um, eDNA on invertebrates and soils has been very interesting. We've also looked at water on some of the estates. Um, and as I mentioned, using LIDAR and, and drone surveys to look at woody vegetation. Um, and just finally, just a little note on citizen science, actually, we've, we've, we haven't gone into it too much, but we've got some interesting plans in the pipeline. Um, but we did have quite fun with Bunloyd when we did our first natural capital kind of baseline back in 2021. And we had 10 camera traps across the site and we actually uploaded them to an organisation called Mammal Web, which is uh, really exciting. So you basically upload, you can see here where we sort of uploaded various different um, uh, sequences from the camera traps. And then people can go on and press this button and classify the project and you can literally see a 20 second clip from the camera traps and um, and tell what, what that is and what you can see here at Bunlow it's really interesting it's mostly deer frankly as you might expect in Scotland uh, but we have got obviously badgers we've got a couple of badger sets on site and then we've got quite a lot of wild boar actually which I quite like uh, although maybe may, may not so much but um, I, I just it's, as an example of citizen science I always recommend just go and have a look at Mammal Web it's actually quite relaxing to send 10 minutes just classifying video there we go that's me brilliant thank you Ben for hurtling through <laughs> all those metrics oh, no I'm really 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 grateful to you I know you joined us sort of last minute because we were really keen to sort of have show some of the the more unusual um, and by that I mean less common um, metrics that are being measured um, I suppose just a quick question and then we'll, we'll answer questions I know Brian needs to answer a question in the Q&A and um, Chelsea's been <laughs> um, typing away on chat answering questions thank you so much um, uh, how does how does it how do some of those those metrics that you're measuring for on baselines turn in to something that is sellable I suppose would be my question because obviously we know more with like woodland carbon code we're selling woodland carbon credits and biodiversity gain units but what about some of those, those different ones yeah so it's interesting so just, just to be clear we are also looking at the woodland carbon code and all the others yeah. and, stuff. We've, and we're yeah. engaging we, we know them quite well and we've engaged with the last couple of years and as you might know I'm sure you Know, Helen. Um, rewilding as a as a as a natural regeneration process kind of falls through the gaps in a lot of things. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you're going to optimize for carbon with the woodland carbon code, you would end up with a citrus plantation across the entire UK. You know, a, a little bit less than that is biodiversity, is, is broad leaves, and a little bit and much lower than that is natural regeneration. Now, what we've actually some of the work that we've identified and some of the uh, scientists we've engaged with, for example. As a, as a researcher led by Kim Calder over in the University of Ghent, who recently announced research with LIDAR, and they said there's about 100% more biomass and carbon in the broadleaf forest the woodland that they were looking at. And then um, oh. the other one is, um, I've got a bit blank there, but um, oh yeah, we're also doing some work at NEP, or what, there's a PhD student working there, which is looking at the rewilding scrub. And when you have a rewilding system where you have natural grazers in it, because they're grazing the trees, they don't grow big. But what we found is that they're actually putting a lot more carbon into, or what they found, a lot more carbon is actually going down to the roots. So the allometric mm -hmm. equations in the Woodland Carbon Code aren't as up to date as they could be. And we're hoping that that kind of work can feed into those projects. So whilst we're sort of, well, our aim is to sort of go harker on the science, feed into these systems that hopefully when we come to do a five year review, those, you know, that will have sort of fed in advance. On the biodiversity credits, it's a bit tough, frankly, because with biodiversity, you've got the entire web of life, as I mentioned, and you've also got diversity and abundance. So we had some audio moss taken on one of the sites. Uh, so using audio uh, recordings of, of bird songs, and that's a really nice, in and birds are really nice indicator of species because then yeah, they reflect invertebrates and invertebrates reflect the condition of your habitats. But how well, we, can get, we can get some nice lists of bird species that the things have been, that are, the AI has spotted from the thing, but how do you know if that is one robin or if, if you see five robin calls for example is that five robins or is that one robin that's been standing next to the microphone five times and likes to sing <laughs> so it is, it's one of those things is we, we, I'm not, honestly at the moment we're sort of working with a few organizations trying to work out how to convert those something that we can essentially replicate so it's got scientifically valid and replicable but it's really fascinating yeah. it's that kind of I've been learning a lot about biodiversity it's not actually I'm actually a carbon specialist so <laughs> that's great thanks ben but very envious of your job envious of everyone's jobs actually they sound um 
<laughs> it will sound great. Um, so I know we've barely got any time left. I'm happy. We're ha I think those who can stay a little bit longer, just like three, four minutes over. Um, uh, I know many of us have got meetings, myself included, um, just so we can take a couple more questions. Um, Kate's asking if we can share the slides. Um, I don't know. We'll ask the participants if they're willing to do that. And if they are, we'll make sure you get them all okay, afterwards. Chris, I just wanted to come to you because I just was interested if whether you had any, having looked at ben, um, Ben's presentation about sort of biodiversity and you're focusing on woodland carbon code. Have you been looking at biodiversity within the work you're doing at Carbon Bank? I know that you're looking at all different types of trees, for example, with the ESC model. I wonder if you could just answer that and then also we'll come back to a question that Annie asked about whether whether your tool um, looked at additionality tests as well. We're looking into biodiversity in a gate. So really that tool does just address woodlands at the moment. Um, and we are sort of generally doing a land search and looking for partners with land. So yes, although we're called Carbon Bank, um, rewilding biodiversity, net gain, ecosystem services, we do all of that as well. Okay. And in terms of additionality, no, we don't address it at that first sweep. Um, you know, I'll run through a few constraints, a few other constraints that weren't mentioned. We don't address it at that first sweep, partly because the clock's running if it's on the market um, and we want to get as fast as possible to the, the second phase. Thanks, Chris. That's great. Um, and then I'm just going to come to you, Chelsea, and you, Bryony, and then we'll we'll wrap up. And um, Chelsea, you've been ans answering lots of different questions on chat. I'm just wondering if you wanted to point out any and, and talk talk through any of them. Oh, I press. Yep. Um, yeah, so really we uh, there was just a few questions around um, what issues did we find with uh, with stacking. Um, so just takes us back to that point really around the fact that the the, the whole aim and objective of, of setting up a market that we are um, is so that we can um, we can bring in what well, we can generate a number of environmental services from one project and therefore that increases the the financial incentive to our landholders to take part to co commit to a 30 year agreement um, and to actually you know give larger portions of their land potentially. Um, but also from the buyer's perspective, um, if they're coming in for only one unit type, that price might be slightly more lower or achievable because the project itself has been paid by multiple different types of units or environmental services. So it's quite crucial to us. But yeah, we did find um, we found issues with stacking between well, stacking between woodland carbon code and biodiversity gain is not is not possible. Um, and uh, aside from that, woodland carbon code currently doesn't not particularly fit very well with our market process timelines so how we have to prep a project before market round and accredit it, it doesn't work very well with that validation and verification process that's inbuilt in the woodland carbon code so i'm still testing that out um, for future market rounds uh, and the nutrient neutrality side of things we've got a couple of accredited standards within wessex but again we don't really have much um, in terms of metrics for standardised accreditation for those types of services. Um, and at the same time, within our catchment area, the Bristol-Avon, annoyingly, we don't have any uh, regulatory demand. So currently we don't have buyer demand, whereas if you look somewhere like Pool, huge regulatory demand, hence why Entrade have another market set up there purely on nutrients. So change in environment, change in policy, change in legislation, we're just trying to adapt to it. Um, and it will enable us eventually to uh, um, to kind of like broaden and, and redesign our project specs as well, because we want to be able to do more. We want to be able to scrub got mentioned earlier. Um, and it's one of those key habitats, those, you know, those successional zones between a woodland edge and a, and a grassland, for example. And the frustration at the moment we have, you know, is we some of those habitats just aren't recognised well, particularly in the biodiversity metric. And and they're key for us, you know, and ecologically where they're going, but that's screaming to be you know, a successional scrub mosaic zone. And so we've tried to, you know, form our own project specifications for habitats that are valuable like that. But um, yeah, there, there's lots of stuff that, you know, we're in very early stages at the moment. We've been really fortunate to be able to pilot this at this really early stage. But um, yeah, those are some of the kind of key things that we've been finding doing our, our baselines and, and working with our landholders. And poor landholders, they've got such a willingness 
um, in their approach to come to us and go, I'm interested in any projects that, that you think can support wildlife, that maybe we can run alongside our agricultural practices. Here's our farm business model. You tell us what will work. And it's so quick to whittle it down through our desk based studies and historic environment records and topography and soil geology and, and all of that stuff. And then get to the metric and find another kind of. So you end up the filter effects massive at the moment, and we need to kind of try and find ways of cutting through some of that red tape um, where where it's ecologically valuable to do so. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's really, really helpful. I'm sure people are nodding away going, yeah, that, that's happening in our project too. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's, it's, good. it's great that there is this community of, of practice. Um, in, in one minute, thank, and thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, uh, one minute, Bryony, was there something you answered uh, that you wanted just to flag up? We are recording this. We are capturing the learnings. It will be in the toolkit. Um, hopefully everyone's familiar with the toolkit, so there'll be more case studies coming through. Um, but actually, did Bryony have to jump? I don't know. No, there she is. Um, uh, Bryony, anything you wanted to close yeah. us out with? Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things Kate at Winters had asked us about how we manage the expectations of farmers. And that was a really key thing for us because we do feel at the moment with all the sort of elm and everything else that's going on with agricultural uh, reform, that they're being sort of consulted to death, you know, test and trials and all that sort of thing. So, you know, that was one of the reasons we were particularly keen on working with a group we'd already been working with, that we were clear from the outset that it was about information gathering and um, knowledge raising uh, and awareness of opportunity raising with our land managers rather than particularly delivering, you know, uh, an actual outcome at the end, an output at the end for them financially. So I think we would, you know, that was really important that we just made it clear that there wouldn't necessarily be money at the end of it, but they would be armed with knowledge that would help them make informed decisions for their land holding in the future. Um, that's great, a really important point. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, the more knowledge sharing, I, th I think we are in this really early stage where it's just a lot, a lot of knowledge sharing, you say, and understanding what the barriers are moving through them. Um, I know this has been a whistle stop tour, and I really appreciate everyone sort of squeezing in the enormous work on the project down to sort of 10 minute slice um, <laughs> and, and for your time today. So thank you so much, um, Chris, Bryony, Ben, Chelsea. It's been a pleasure. And thanks to those who are joining. Um, uh, who joined us today so there will be a recording up on the toolkit and we will let everyone know about the slides when we reply to everyone who, who registered today so thank you all um great lunch and learn i learned a lot <laughs> and uh, look forward to seeing you again thank you thank Thanks. you bye thank you. bye